Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is hearing loss. You know, with everybody wearing their headsets so close to their ears and everybody screaming with tinnitus, which we've done a previous show on that's on youtube.com slash vhfilm, um, I thought it might be appropriate for us to address hearing loss, the diet, and some of the supplements that may be helpful for prevention and treatment of hearing loss, and then explain to some of the mechanical things that could be problematic that cause hearing loss. When we think about hearing loss, there's primarily two different causes or types. There's conductive, which means there's actually a mechanical uh, obstruction in the air, a mechanical problem in the ear, something's not working functionally right, we've got water in the ear, something's going on mechanically with the ear. And then we have uh, the sensory loss, which is actually truly real nerve damage. And most of that is usually brought on by loud noises over a lengthy period of time. We'll go over some other causes as well. But what that does is it damages the little um, hair cells that we have in our ears that pick up sound. And once those are damaged, they are not repairable. So as we're seeing everybody around with the headsets on, obviously with our kids we have to be very mindful that if we can hear the music, that means it's way too loud. Um, you know, there's a little test to kind of see whether or not you may be undergoing some hearing loss, and it's something real, real basic. And what you do is you put your fingers up next to your ear, and you kind of rub it. And you put, put the two fingers together like this, and if you can hear that noise, that's going on, that usually means that you can hear fairly close to full frequency. If you can't hear that rubbing going on next to your ear, you need to go to your audiologist uh, or your uh, ear, nose, and throat uh, specialist doctor because that means chances are good you suffered some damage or you may have a mechanical problem that could be preventing your full range of hearing. Um, one of the major causes of hearing loss is the accumulation of wax that occurs inside the ears. It literally causes a block. And that can be due to excessive noise in that the body's putting up some source of protective barrier. It can be due or caused by the diet, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, all those types of things. Uh, the diet that eats, uh, diet which contains a lot of saturated fats and sugars can make you produce more of that little thicker type of earwax and oil that can be problematic in causing a blockage or an obstruction in the ear that interferes with your hearing. Um, middle ear infections, and you know, I know oftentimes docs will look in there and they'll say, no, the ear is fine, but there can be, deep in the middle ear, which they sometimes can't see, there can be moisture or yeast buildup or an underlying viral or bacterial infection that can just sit there over years and literally can damage these little ear hairs and other things in the ear mechanically that can lend itself to hearing loss. So we'll talk about some of the natural treatments that are available for that as well too that can get rid of uh, potential ear infection or underlying um, types of uh, water storage that's occurring in that inner ear or middle ear. Um, poor diet and nutritional deficiencies. Um, if you're lacking certain vitamins your body cannot maintain the actual little capillaries, blood vessels, the little uh, hair cells. It can't maintain them, and then you're going to lose your ability to hear. Or the collagen, the little flexible, pliable, the eardrum, so to speak. If you're collagen deficient and lacking vitamin C, that's going to harden, and you're not going to be able to hear as well. So nutritional deficiencies as far as vitamins and certain minerals as well as we'll look in the supplement portion can contribute to hearing loss. Medications. Now the primary medications that are responsible are going to be your diuretics and your antibiotics. And that's why people who um, let their, allow their kids to go on antibiotics for ear infections, which 90% of the time are viral or fungal, that's probably one of the top reasons why there's hearing losses in uh, hearing loss in children so it you really have to proceed with caution and if you can try some alternative form to get those infections gone as I'll review it in the um, supplements uh, section boy give that a shot because the antibiotics 
like I said, most of the infections are not bacterial. And I know the docs are trying to prevent you know, an infection from turning into a bacterial infection that re reaches the mastoid, and, and they're preventative trying you know, to prevent something that becomes worse. But the problem lies is when you go on those antibiotics, them in and of itself can cause permanent hearing loss. And in a very high percentage, anywhere from 2 to 10 percent of kids are affected by antibiotics due to prescription antibiotics. So um, when we're talking about age-related, 40 percent of our seniors uh, that are 75 and above have hearing loss and gosh a good portion of it is tinnitus. It's where you get that ringing in the ears which really interferes with the body's ability to be able to hear properly. Um, structural ab abnormalities, uh, TMJ, cervical spine issues, because remember your auditory is all in the back of the brain, the auditory portion of the brain is all in the back of the skull. And so obviously if that cervical is out of alignment and you're not getting a good blood flow to that area, that can also affect your hearing. Sinus uh, problems or chronic sinus uh, infections or, or allergies, uh, eating foods that really are mucus inducing, milk products and dairy can also interfere with the hearing because you've got that chronic moisture and dripping going on and over the long haul can contribute to long term hearing loss as well. When we're talking about the diet for uh, prevention of hearing loss, a diet that's high in antioxidant foods, particularly your fruits and vegetables and your nuts. We really have to watch the highly saturated fats and absolutely no oxidative trans fats that you're going to find in margarine or shortening that you're going to find in most of your cookies and all those Twinkies and Ding Dongs and all those types of foods or certain like slim fast drinks. They're all going to have those trans fats and I mention those by name. It's important for people to recognize the ingredients and things and those do have a lot of trans fats. Um, you want a high fiber alkaline diet and foods that require some chewing, believe it or not. Because chewing, when you actually chew instead of drinking your foods or eating mushy cooked foods all the time, actually loosens up the ear racks. It helps with the hearing mechanism of moving things along. The saliva, it help, saliva, it helps clean things out. So you've got to have some meals in which you're actually chewing, not just one, two, swallow, like you would do with uh, french fries or the bread that smushes into a ball, but real foods, some raw fruits and vegetables that require that chewing action. You're going to want to um, avoid all allergen producing foods. So if you know particularly of foods that tend to cause you allergy or allergic responses, you need to avoid them because it's going to increase mucus and mucus throughout this area obviously is going to interfere with your hearing, lending itself possibly to permanent hearing loss. Um, when we talk about, and I'm going to turn this over because when we talk about supplements for hearing loss, a lot of these are more preventative than anything else. And a good multiple high in, in B vitamins is essential, essential for the ears, the little ear hairs, all of those little membranes inside, particularly B6. Um, you're needing in combination with some source of a natural vitamin C. And your 25 milligram orange a day isn't going to cut it you need some good dosages and as a general rule you want at least a minimum of a thousand milligrams of subsource of buffered C per day just to maintain particularly as we grow older and if you smoke remember smoking and I didn't list that on the prior page also decreases the absorption of vitamin C which lends itself to hardening of the arteries and hardening of the a little uh, intricate uh, ear issues ear canals ear draining the little capillaries that feed all are interfered with. So a good multiple high in B vitamins, extra vitamin C. Now if you have already some hearing loss, um, getting or keeping the vitamin C levels up does help repair those little capillaries 
that lend themselves for hearing and actually that feed back into the auditory system in the brain. It's very, very important that you have good blood supply going to the ears and support of the nervous system. And remember B12 and other B vitamins are real important for supporting the nerves that help with the auditory and the actual hearing and the process of information that we take in as well. Um, in addition, C helps convert cholesterol back into bile. And remember, higher cholesterols or that thick, sludgy kind of um, fat causes a buildup or excess buildup of wax in the ears, which interferes with hearing. Um, fish oil or plant-based like flax oils, borage oil, all of those plant-based oils really help reduce inflammation. And they make your uh, fat secretions like earwax in your body. You know, you, you've got to have some earwax for protection, but it helps loosen it and keep it to where it doesn't become impacted. You know, one of the biggest uh, mechanical issues for getting earwax trapped is um, if you don't properly clean the ears or using Q-tips. And we see a lot of, lot of injuries, especially with kids unsupervised with Q-tips, sticking it in their ear and literally causing hearing damage and scar tissue and pushing that wax back into the ear. Um, a really good little combination of something to do is about uh, one to one parts of uh, vinegar with water uh, and you can do a, like three drops of hydrogen peroxide with that, mix it up and you can put that in the ear and that can help loosen the wax. There are also, um, there's uh, oils like Wally's ear oil, uh, which is a combination of various oils that can loosen that wax up so that it can come out naturally. Um, Vitamin B12, I mentioned earlier, if you do have nerve damage or tinnitus, uh, B12 in 1,000 to 2,000 micrograms of a methacolobin source, not the standard ones you get from the grocery store, um, but a good sublingual under the tongue methacolobin source can help support nerve health. Um, Anti-inflammatory wise, Bromelain, which comes from pineapple, or you can eat pineapple, also is a wonderful anti-inflammatory. So when the area is inflamed, uh, maybe because of moisture within the ear, it can help reduce the inflammation. Um, ginkgo biloba and vitamin E, as long as you're not on blood thinners, slightly thin the blood and increase, um, well, there are antioxidants as well, too. And ginkgo biloba also reduces inflammation, but they can increase the blood vessel circulation, cerebral circulation to the area, which aids hearing. Um, if you do get water buildup or ear infections, one of the most effective things that I know my customers use and I've used personally, uh, my 13 and a half year old son has never been on antibiotics for an ear infection. And as I mentioned before, my 21 year old when he was two was on so many antibiotics that it actually um, destroyed his good bacteria in his bowel and he had to have emergency surgery, tear it open and reset the bowel because there was no more good bacteria to weigh down the bowel because of all the antibiotics used to kill off ear infections. This is a nice alternative that will dry it up, kill bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. And I've written the protocol on that, and it works. If you'll use it, it works. Um, Grapeseed extract, we use that a lot with uh, bruising or with people who have capillary bruising. Also, in good dosages, 200 milligrams uh, twice a day, will help with capillary health as well, too. Uh, CoQ10. Um, now, there's so many studies on CoQ10 increasing, increasing cellular activity in the brain, in the heart. Well, it also helps with the auditory system so that you can receive information and interpret information. So many, I know, uh, so many of my elderly customers literally seem to almost receive the information, but their brains can't interpret the information. So, CoQ10 is helpful at doing that. Magnesium. Now, the National Institute of Health estimates that over 90% of Americans are magnesium deficient. That being the case, it is really almost ne very necessary that you supplement with some source of magnesium, particularly as we grow older, because remember too, magnesium helps with bone health, uh, muscle spasms and cramps. It's, it's a, a key electrolyte, particularly if you work out. But I mean, they had some really good dosages on here, but uh, on most of the research. But it prevents damage to the little, um, little cells, the little hair cells that register the hearing. 
really good studies that support that magnesium citrate, not oxide, that the docs oftentimes recommend that only has like a 7% absorption, but the citrates the research supported really could prevent damage. So if you have any damage that is believed to have been caused by that, boy, I'd bump that magnesium level up. Inacetylcysteine decreases mucus buildup and um, the thickening of the mucus in the sinuses, the ear cavities and all, uh, and the lungs, it can thin that a little bit. And last but not least, this is something that's used a lot in Europe, even taught to European doctors, something called ear candles. And I meant to bring those along, but what they are is they're little long candles, and you have to do it under, under supervision. But basically what it is, it's a candle that you light on fire, it burns very slowly, and it forms a vacuum in the tube, and it literally, I, I mean, in my ears most of the time, it'll suck up that much earwax and dried skin and all out of my ears. And I mean, I do not eat a high saturated fat diet, but that can really help with uh, hearing loss. I usually do a little bit of Wally's ear oil ahead of time before I do it, loosens the, um, the secretions up, pulls it out and cleans it. You know, about every six months, it's very helpful. I hope this is a, a little bit of a guide. There's a lot more information that I could give you, but in a nutshell, these are the things that came out mainly on research. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today we're going to do some yoga for the hands. And real quick, I'm going to go through five exercises that would be great for you to try and practice on a daily basis when you first get up in the morning if you've got arthritis or the starting of arthritis in the hands. First, just making the basic fist. And I know a lot of people will have a hard time with this, but just trying to make that basic fist, trying to get circulation and the fluids moving in the hands, making that fist. And second exercise, touching the thumb to the fingertips. This works on getting the coordination of the hands back together. I know they use this in, for DUIs to check and see whether you're under the influence, but that also is very helpful and putting a little pressure on in that regard. Putting your hands together and trying to get your fingers to meet. And I know a lot of seniors are like that, but trying to do a little pressure in there to try to get those fingers to meet could be helpful. A fourth exercise is we like to put the fingers together and try and separate them out and push against each other. This actually exercises the hands a little bit. Fifth exercise is the nice little stretch that we oftentimes see. Now, if you've got advanced arthritis, you're probably not going to be doing this or not, might not be able to do this. But if you can practice this sequence, uh, and once again, uh, yoga exercises for the hands, I think it may be helpful in warming up your hands in the morning so you're a little bit more mo mobile. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. No time for trivia today. We have to get right off. We have nine articles to go through, and all of them are important because you're probably not going to hear much of it. On any of your uh, tabloid medical shows, the doctors tend to be kind of placid in regards to uh, what they report. First one, Canadian Journal of Physiology, Physiology and Pharmacology. Interesting article on regular use of vitamins in prevention of colon cancer. This is important because you have to remember a lot of oncologists have been recommending no vitamins whatsoever during chemo. Well, here's what they discovered. They took a few dip different groups of animals mostly rats, and expose them to a uh, carcinogen called 1,2-dimethylhydrazine. Now, obviously, the animals that did not get a multivitamin developed cancers. However, how did the rats fare that were being given multivitamins through the diet? Well, 84%, they said, showed a significant reduction in any precancerous lesions. Not only that, the mice that were getting the multivitamin on a regular basis with the carcinogen did not develop any tumors. They also, the authors concluded that the multivitamin mineral supplements 
synergistically contribute to the cancer chemopreventive potential. Not too crazy about the word chemopreventive, we're only talking nutrients. And hence, regular supplements of multivitamins and minerals could reduce the risk of colon cancer. Something to think about now in regards to taking multivitamin. Now, cancer article number two. This has to do with head and neck cancers. This was from the Journal of Carcinogenesis. Remember, this is probably going to be in the month of February of 2012. Grapeseed extract kills head and neck cancer cells, leaves healthy cells unharmed. I'm not altering the title. This is exactly what they said, again, printed in the Journal of Carcinogenesis. They said, quote, besides it having an incredible dramatic effect, grapeseed extract creates these conditions that are unfavorable for cancer growth. Specifically, the paper shows that grapeseed extract both damages cancer cells DNA via increased reactive oxygen species and stops the pathway that allows the cancer cells the ability to repair. As seen by decreased levels of DNA repair molecules BRCA1, RAD51, and DNA repair FOCI. So think about that. Again, they said, quote, in the article, not me, the grapeseed extract killed the cancer cells but not the healthy cells. And they said, researchers also said, I think the whole point is that cancer cells have a lot of defective pathways that are very, very vulnerable. If you target those pathways, the same is not true of healthy cells. So grapeseed extract exploits the defective effect of the cancer cells and, in their words, kills it. Pretty interesting, all right? That was cancer article number two. Cancer article number three. Compound mate tea, often known as urban mate, induces death in colon cancer, colon cancer cells. Reported in the Molecular Nutrition and Food Research, volume 55. Actually, this came out in 2011 towards the tail end. It says the caffeine derivatives in mate tea not only induced death in human colon cancer cells, they also reduced important markers of inflammation. Put simply, in the presence of mate tea, the cancer cell self-destructs because its DNA has been damaged. Sounds pretty similar to what the grapeseed extract was for the head and neck cells. They also said, but because the colon and its microflora play a major role in the absorption and metabolism of caffeine-related compounds, the anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer effects of mate tea may be most useful in the colon. And the researchers also made a point of stating out that mate tea is available in many health food stores as well as beginning to see available in some basically grocery stores. So, you have a multivitamin, grapeseed extract, mate tea, even though the multivitamin works with colon cancer also. So, mate with the multivitamin may not be a bad option. All right, cancer article number four, which you're not going to see on the television or in major news networks anytime soon, has to do with an extract of broccoli called dianomethylene. Normally, shortened name or nickname is called DIM. This was printed in the Biomed's Central Open Access Journal of this month, February. They discovered with ovarian cancer cells that not only was DIM able to kill cells, but also prevented cell invasion and angiogenesis, both of which are necessary for cancer to grow. Again, simple extract of broccoli called dianomethylene. Sometimes also an extract of indole 3 carbonyl too which is something to look at. They said in the study, the combination of their chemo drug called cisplastin and DIM suppressed tumor growth in mice by an extra 50% compared to the chemo alone. And cisplastin is a platinum form of chemotherapy. If co-treatment with dianomethylene, or DIM for short, means that a low, low dose or a lower dose of the very harmful chemo drug, cisplastin, can be given to patients without the loss of therapeutic effect, but with reduced side effects, it will represent a significant breakthrough in clinical practice. As you punch in Google, dianomethylene or DIM, you're going to find it's phenomenal for a ton of cancers. If you notice, with a lot of these articles from grapeseed extract, multivitamin, mate, and DIM, a lot of them seem to affect cancer pretty similar by damaging the DNA pathways and preventing its growth. Something to think about. All right, done with the cancer. 
Now the vanity. Now a lot of people out there, especially women, like to find ways to increase the moisture levels of the skin. Well, another substance derived from French maritime bark called pine bark or pycnogenol had a very profound effect. Now what they did is they took just 12 weeks, 12 weeks, at 75 milligrams this pine bark, otherwise known as pycnogenol. And this is what they discovered for regards to skin hydration. All right, they found out that pycnogenol increased a substance called hyaluronic acid in the skin by 44% after 12 weeks, which resulted in increased skin hydration by 8%. This is 12 weeks. We're not talking drinking more water or anything along those lines. They also found out that pine bark and pycnogenol enhanced skin elasticity 25%. Just 12 weeks. Pycnogenol decreased skin fatigue and an added benefit after only 12 weeks. Pycnogenol reduced skin wrinkles by 3%. Didn't say the appearance of skin wrinkles. Reduced skin wrinkles and increased skin smoothness by 6%. That's just 12 weeks. And that's not a cosmetic effect. That's actually improving the skin. And so think about that. This was printed in the Skin Pharmacology and Physiology, uh, Physiology Report this February. And again, with 12 weeks, 75 milligrams. And this one's kind of important too, a little embarrassing, but I have to get this one out in regards to bedwetting in kids. I'm very embarrassing for a lot of kids. But what they discovered was this, that after all these surgeries and medications and basically mental therapy that these kids are going through for bedwetting, guess what found cured the bedwetting? Well, let's back it up. Guess what they found was causing the bedwetting? Constipation. They found out the constipation in the gut was pushing additional pressure along the bladder. So, how did they miraculously cure this bedwetting in all these children without surgery, medication, or any other form of drugs? A laxative. They said, our study showed that a large percentage of these children were cured of nighttime wetting after laxative therapy, period. And this was printed in the Journal of Urology, not some fly-by-night study. So think about that. If your child is having a hard time and embarrassing effect of bedwetting, really look at his diet, maybe not enough fiber, but if it's a little bit of constipation, what an easy, wonderful way of helping a kid out. And basically, last but not least, if we run out of time, is a great way of affecting or getting rid of MRSA, they found, was Manuka honey. Uh, they found out there's no bacteria yet that developed a resistance to honey. And basically, this was published in the Journal of Microbiology. Am I out of time? Is You're out of time. All right, thank Sorry you very about much. That. Oh my gosh, lots of good information. And once ago, you can, uh, once again, you can go on the website vit vit.bz, and Ralph uh, publishes a wonderful little uh, research uh, section in there. I think this is number 122 that you can um, print these articles from. Once again, thank you for joining our show. We appreciate it. Do your research. I wanted to say that. You did good.